opportunities to serve and worship, the things that are happening in, in April. But I want to take this time uh, uh, to pray two, two things. Uh, Brother uh, Wall they was uh, going to drag himself here this morning. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, he had an episode of some sort and they've taken him to Heart and Hospital. And that's all I know. But I want us to pray for him. I also want us to pray for the, uh, the uh, families uh, there in Nashville uh, that uh, had to go through what they went through and are going through so, uh, so much. Uh, all those affected. And it's not just, of course, folks that Nashville are affected. I mean, it, it is a nation. It affects us. And so uh, I want us to lift our hearts uh, to God. In prayer. So if you could, we'll have just a moment of uh, quiet prayer and reflection to give you a moment just in your own heart to settle yourself into what you want to do and, and how you want to see, see, pray. Uh, and then, uh, and then we'll, I'll lead in a short prayer for those two things. And then we'll continue uh, in our worship. The worship, uh, prayer is a part of worship as well. It's not just singing a proclamation of the word. The prayer is important as we gather together collectively. And I think this is an important time for us to just spend a few moments in prayer. So remember the walls uh, as they uh, head uh, over uh, to uh, the hospital, and uh, especially David and Pat, and then remember those families uh, affected by the tragedies uh, there uh, in Nashville getting them this week. Bow your heads in prayer. heaven we come before you even now to lift up before your throne of grace to come boldly before that throne because you say that we can we pray Lord that you will forgive us when we fail you we fail in so many ways individually we fail and collectively as a society we fail and we fail you as God's people your followers, who are to show the world what you are like. We don't always do a very good job. We want to come this morning to lift up some concerns to you and want to start with those in a city not far from us in Nashville, a father who you know went through this tragedy of a senseless killing of, of folks children. And there have, Father, been so many different voices expressing their feelings, expressing, Father, even some very silly things. We forget about these families. We forget about these who devoted themselves to the education and taking care of some of the most innocent in our society. 
We were not surprised by what took place. We do ask that for us that you will help each of us to deal with that, to understand as we can, as you give us that understanding, but most of all, Father, that we do pray for peace. We understand that, Father, the only way that change can happen is if hearts are changed for you, that people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and it changes their lives and it changes their hearts. We do understand that it was evil and entered into somebody. We know that you are good. Be with those families, be with the communities, be with our nation. As we mourn and as we pray, let us who follow you reflect you in these things. The love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Lord, we also want to lift up to you our pastor of marriage, Brother David Wall. Father, he's had a very difficult time throughout this heart procedure. And I pray, Father, that you will just be with him now as he goes to heart and you will take care of him. You will bring him peace to his family as well, and comfort to be Pat especially. The wonderful thing is, Father, that in all things you have control. The wonderful thing is, Father, that for your children, that no matter what, we belong to you. And nothing can separate us from you. We stand on your promises of your word. We stand on the truth of the promises of your word. And we declare that we love you. Help us to be mindful of one another, to live in loving prayer. Mindful of each other. How we can serve each other. Faithful and in love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On this day we call Palm Sunday. We have to have Xander with us in the choir this morning. He and his mother Krista are visiting from Jordan. So if you get a chance to hold them, would you stand and turn to number 302, Lamb of God, number 302. Yeah. 
receive an offering this morning. It's good to see Diane Davis able to be here this morning. Diane, would you ask the blessing on the offering? Father, we're so thankful for this day you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to come and worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you. In spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you so much for all the wonderful things you do for us. We thank you for this offering today, dear Heavenly Father, for those that can give. Those that can't give, we ask this offering to be used according to your will. And and it will go to where it needs to go, dear Heavenly Father, to do the best good. Father, we thank you so much for Brother David. We ask that you be with him and his family as they are at the hospital today. We ask their Heavenly Father that you just put your loving hand on him and give him comfort and healing. And Father, we just pray that you would uh, bless this day, bless Brother Darrell as you bring some message. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and turn to number 326. Blessed Redeemer, 326. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless laws. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, Seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Father, forgive them, thus did he pray, even while his life blood flowed passed away, praying for sinners while in such woe, no one but Jesus ever loved so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see Him on Calvary's tree. Those of you who have been here uh, consistently through the last uh, few weeks and, and actually a couple months uh, now, we've been looking at encounters with Jesus. We've been seeing what uh, has happened with different people who come across Jesus and Jesus actually came in across their paths. Most of the part, what we see and find is that 
It is Jesus who finds these folks versus them finding him for the most part. Uh, and they change, their lives are changed because of these encounters. And I've said and I, I will continue to say that when people encounter Jesus, their lives change. And when Jesus comes to a person's life, sometimes uh, encounter is not uh, a strong enough word. It's really a confrontation. Often when Jesus comes into a person's life or comes to a person, there is a confrontation because often what it is, it is good coming to evil. It is the righteous coming to the unholy. It is the one who loves coming to someone who doesn't really know what love is all about. And so, in all of that, we find Jesus always proclaiming, always teaching, always letting one know who he is, why he came, and what he could do for them. For he is the good shepherd. He is the one who has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we need to understand that we are live in a world that needs to hear the message of Jesus. And I know that in speaking to you and in saying that, you say, well, yeah, I've heard that all my life. Because most of you, from what I know, have been in church most of your life. And you've heard that proclamation from the pulpit. You'll even notice in your bulletins today, maybe some of you did, maybe some of you didn't, but it, it has to do with personal evangelism commitment day. Really all that is is to say that I will live my life in such a way that I proclaim Jesus. But not just that, but that I can tell the good news of somebody about Jesus and what he's done in my life to those around me. Not only in the way I live, but hopefully also in what you say and how you say and even in a way that you lead people to the Word of God and to show them who Jesus is. Understanding that we are all imperfect, that we don't give a perfect presentation of Jesus Christ, but that we come to let them know the best thing that has ever happened. Isn't Jesus the best thing that has ever happened to you? We say that, and thank you for saying that and shaking your heads, yes, but do you live that? Do you really tell people that? Or do you just tell your pastor on Sunday when he asks that question because you want everybody to know I go along, right? I'm not taking away from your yes at all. Thank you for that, really. But you know, it's easy when you hear to say, yes, Jesus is the best thing that ever, has ever happened to me and I want people to know. Well, it's easy to say that here, to commit that here. The question is, how do we live that out in our lives, especially when we're having a really bad day. Whatever that means for you to have a really bad day. Because for each of us, a bad day is, is different. Today we're going to look at a man in authority. He asks vital questions of Jesus because he has to. And the reason I say he has to is because he's put in a position where he has to be a judge. I don't know that he listens very well. And what we'll find really is this man in authority is himself, in a sense, being judged by one who has ultimate authority. But we also find that this man who thought that he had the authority, the authority to say this man lives and this man dies, was part of God's sovereign plan that had been established before the foundation of the world so that we could have that good news that Jesus saves. Amen. And so we come to Pontius Pilate. And if you have your copies of God's Word, let me ask you to open them up to John chapter 18. John chapter 18, we will begin reading from verse 28. And we'll go ahead and read through the end of the chapter, although we're really not uh, 
going to spend all of our time in, in looking through the whole of this that we read, but I want to give you the sense of what Pilate is doing in his interaction with and his encounter with Jesus. Before we read, and as I set this up a little bit, understand that Jesus has been, his ministry has been a part of what has been going on in Israel for about three years. It is not like Pontius Pilate hasn't heard of him. And yet, as long as Jesus will keep the peace in some way, shape, or form, Pontius Pilate doesn't really care about it. He only wants to make sure that he doesn't cause trouble in Israel for Rome. Because if he causes trouble in Israel for Rome, then that's trouble for Pontius Pilate. Sounds like people in our government today, you know, don't cause any problem. And yet, Paul even tells us as Christ followers that we're not to cause government problems so that we can live in peace and practice our faith in peace and to be good citizens where he places us. But that's another sermon. <laughs> if you are able to, let me ask you to stand in honor of God's word. Again, beginning with the 28th verse and reading through the end of the chapter. And by the way, too, uh, again, Jesus is uh, in at three different trials, if you will, uh, Jewish trials. All of them done illegally as far as Jewish law and jurisprudence would have it. None of them were done right. But now it's time for the Jews to take him to Pontius Pilate. Verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters themselves, otherwise they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man weren't a criminal, we wouldn't have handed him over to you. Pilate told them, You take him and judge him according to your law. It is not legal for us to put anyone to death or to execute anyone, the Jews declared. They said this so that Jesus' words might be fulfilled, indicating what kind of death he was going to die. The Pilate went back into headquarters, summoned Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Are you asking this on your own, or have others told you about me? I'm not a Jew, am I? Pilate replied. Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. You say that I am a king, Jesus replied. I was born for this, and I've come into the world for this, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? said Pilate. And after he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. Now you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. You may be seated. God add his blessings to the reading of his word today as we begin. As I have said, as we come to these verses that we have read this morning, it is the morning of what we now call Good Friday. Jesus has been arrested in the garden by the Jewish leaders and uh, soldiers that would have been under their uh, purview. He's been brought to, to Caiaphas' house. He is brought before uh, Caiaphas and Annas, who was Caiaphas' father-in-law and had been the high priest. 
He's then brought before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish Supreme Court, the rulers. And now they have, again, caused things to happen where they move along in what they are accomplishing or wanting to accomplish. So they move over from one area of Jerusalem to another area of Jerusalem, to the upper city where the Roman governor is, Pontius Pilate. And understand how Jesus looked in all of this. He does not yet have his crown of thorns, okay? That was bestowed upon him by the Romans. However, it, Matthew tells us in his description of what takes place during the trial there with the Jews, that they spat in his face, they struck him with their fists, they slapped him, and they said, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? So Jesus has been abused physically already. He tells us even before that in the Garden of Gethsemane that as he prayed there, he began to sweat as of great drops of blood. He was physically exhausted, folks, even as he came to this point. And it's kind of interesting, if you will, that the Jews have to maintain their cleanliness for the Passover so that they so they don't go into where Pilate is. They go only so far and then you know, here's Jesus, and Pilate has to come out to them. And yet in their hypocrisy, they don't have any problem with beating up the man they call Jesus of Nazareth. I don't want to really talk much about who Pilate is. If you've got a good Bible dictionary, look that up. Or, as we do nowadays, Google it. And you can see Pontius Pilate really was someone who lived and died and was the governor of uh, that area from A.D. 26 to A.D. 36. What we know about him is that he was proud, he was cruel, he was shrewd, he was self-seeking, and like any good Roman, he was superstitious. He even listened to his wife every once in a while. I guess, guys, sometimes maybe that's the only good thing we can take from Pilate, you know? And he understands what the Jews are doing here, that they come in envy and spite and jealousy over, over Jesus. And he understands that's why they're there, but he still has to deal with them. Because if he doesn't rule well here, he gets back. He's already in trouble a little bit with the emperor at this time because of the way he handled something else. So he's got to make sure that things don't explode. He's got to make sure that he doesn't have insurrection. He's got to make sure that Rome is doing okay. So he, he asks the, to the Jews, what charges do you bring? And it's a pretty simple question, isn't it? What charges do you bring? I mean, in our court of law, that's done all the time. When you come, you know, if they're charges, if they read the charges. This is what it is. Here's what, do you understand the charges? I mean, that's what they say. But here's the judge saying, what are they? I, I want to know what you bring. Because for me to judge, for me to put this man on trial, I've got to know what he's charged with. You love their answer. It's pretty ambiguous, isn't it? Well, if he wasn't a criminal, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Uh, wouldn't you like that to happen to just about anybody, huh? Somebody just decided that you were out of line and they just brought you before a judge. The judge says, what's it about? They said, well, we wouldn't have brought him here if we didn't want him for a good reason. We well, didn't answer my question. And Pilate, again, he understands all this. He says, okay, then. Why really have you come? Take care of it with your laws. He's a Jew, you're Jews, take care of Jewish laws. 
And then they answer and they let themselves be seen for what they really are because they understood, you see, <coughs> Rome wouldn't let Jews execute people. Now we do find later on, after Jesus' resurrection and after his ascension and after a while when the, we have Stephen, that the Jews did kill somebody. They did it by stoning. The Jews didn't want an execution, if you will, by stoning. And even that, the, again, that was, you know, they overlooked that, turned their eye to that. But they wanted something else. They wanted Jesus' ministry. They wanted Jesus' life. They wanted everything about him. They wanted him to be executed. Not only did they want him to be executed, they wanted him to be executed on a cross. And they couldn't do that, and only Rome could do that. And so they had to try and make it in such a way that Pilate would hear and understand that this man was dangerous to Rome. And I know, again, all that I'm saying to you here is something that you've been taught for many years. And yet we need to understand, as Jesus comes to Pilate in a way, the questions that Pilate asks, And even the questions that were asked of Jesus during this time as he even came. When he first came in and entered the city, you know, on that Sunday, Palm Sunday, which is today. The question that the people were asking is, who is this? Who is this man? And I said, well, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So again, Pilate is aware of who he is. He just doesn't care about who he is because he doesn't have to yet. The Jews say, look, it's not legal for us to put anyone to death, to execute them. Pilate, that's what we want from you. So Pilate takes Jesus inside to talk to him because he's got to get to the bottom of all of this. And so Pilate examines Jesus. First he meets with the Jews and then he examines Jesus. And he really wants to know, okay, because what's Pilate concerned about? Are you putting yourself up against the emperor? Are you trying to say that you are somebody that's going to cause Rome problems? Because if you are, then I've got, then that's my problem. So he asks him the question, are you king of the Jews? Are you king of the Jews? I don't know, when I was younger, I always thought, well, why didn't Jesus just say, yeah, I am? But he doesn't. And he asks and says to Pilate, really, in what way are you asking that of me? If you think that I have come to set up a earthly kingdom, if you think that my realm is something that will be here, then no, I'm not the king that you think I am. For my kingdom is not of this place. And it's really a very good answer to the question that he asked. Because it is the truth. You see, he said, Pilate, it is not a question of the realm, it is a question of the rule. It is not a question of the realm, that is, the location of my kingdom, it is the question of the rule, that is, who do I rule? I guess one way to think about that in earthly terms might be, do you remember when David had to flee Jerusalem because Absalom had taken over the kingdom, the throne? Those who went with David, you see, David no longer ruled over the realm of Israel because Absalom did, but those who were with him were under the rule of the king. And so Jesus wants Pilate to understand very quickly, very easily, 
that I have an authority, that I am a king. But I'm not concerned about where, so I'm not a problem to Rome. But I'm concerned about who. I'm concerned about hearts. That's where my rule is. If it had been different, if I'd come and this was to be my realm, then my followers would not have even let me be arrested by the Jews. You remember his disciples tried to do that in the garden. <laughs> you know? Good old Peter couldn't even swing a sword very well, did he? Went for the guy's head and cut off an ear. And Jesus said it is enough because he knew that night would come. He knew that what was happening was part of the plan. He knew that that was the will of the Father. He knew that if he wanted to, he could have called myriads of angels, thousands upon thousands of angels to battle for him because he is the commander of the Lord's army. If that's what God's plan was, then Jesus could have done that, but that wasn't what God's plan was. Pilate wanted to know, are you a political king conspiring against Caesar? And the answer to that is no. But if he is asking, are you the messianic king of, of the Jews, the king of Israel? Then the answer to that is yes. And of course, again, he didn't care. He wasn't a Jew. All I care about is Rome. You might ask yourself, what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with the world we're living in? Let me kind of shift a little bit to our world today where people question who Jesus is. There are those who want to come intellectually to discover to who is this Jesus. Let me, let me, let me Google Jesus and see what comes up. And often they want to try and figure this guy out or figure these Christians out or figure what this story is all about. Hey, we're a week from Easter, folks. And there are going to be a lot of people that are going to come to our churches because that is, they've got to be there Easter. And if I make my appearance on Easter, I'm good. But there are others who say, why do we go to church on Easter? You don't go any other time. Well, well I'm kind of curious about this whole Jesus thing. See, Pilate was curious. Pilate was wondering. Pilate had an agenda. And people today, if they come to Jesus Christ, often have their own agendas. And they, they come to sit in a position of authority over Jesus to ask him, state your case for who you are. When what's actually happening often is that Jesus is searching them out. He's looking at their hearts. He's trying to help them to see what their need really is. You see, he is the one that sits in authority over those who come to question him. Now the first question that Pilate asks of Jesus, he says, you're the king of the Jews? And the you in the Greek is what starts it. That's the emphatic, in emphasis, the emphatic words that starts that sentence. You, you, look at you. You're beat up. Your people won't like you. Well, I heard what happened, you know, at the beginning of the week, but look at you, and you're the king? You can almost hear the contempt. Folks, you hear that contempt all the time in our world today. It is interesting, if, even if you will, the anti-Christian bias in some of the reporting of the stories out of Nashville this week. The headlines of all the major newspapers, not one of them said it was a Christian school, it was just an elementary school in Nashville. And I think when some of the Christians began to talk about what happened 
again, you know, we want to talk about gun laws. We want to talk about gender identity. See, they come to contempt and with contempt to Jesus even today, and it should surprise you. It should surprise us. But it's there. And the thing is that, you know, when Jesus comes again, he's coming as judge. That should scare us a little bit too. And yet, Though our works and our deeds and our words will be judged by him, and some of them will be burned up in his purifying fire, and some of them will be refined by his purifying fire of judgment, we will be saved through him. So Pilate gets aggravated. A little bit aggravated at Jesus. But I love what he says when Jesus comes to him. I want you to understand who I am and why I've come. Jesus says these words, I was born for this. What was he born for? I've heard a lot of different things, of course. And they're all true. They come from the word of God. He was born to save his people from their sins, the Bible tells us. He said that he was born to die. The Bible tells us that as well. But we find in John, as he talks to his disciples there after that last supper, he also tells them about the truth. And look what he says. I have born, been born for this. I came into the world for this. To testify to the truth. The truth. For this reason I was born as a king. To testify to um, the truth. Not a truth. The truth. Or if we like to say, the truth. And then Pilate asks a question that many people ask. What is truth? Now, I think if Pilate really wanted to know and, and have an answer to that, Jesus would have given it to him, but Pilate didn't wait around to hear an answer. Because by this time, Pilate was like, I, I'm done with, with you. Because he found no fault in him. He knew that he was an innocent man. He knew... He knew that Jesus, as he explained to him, was, his kingdom was not going to set itself up against Rome. And so we don't have Rome intervene in all of this. But he says, what is truth? Can you please tell me what truth is? Well, he didn't even wait around for an answer. He just left that. So I want us to look at very quickly what is truth. And, uh, and it was raised by Pilate. And as we look at that and we define it, uh, I found a, a list by Stephen Lawson of these things, six things that I'm going to give to you very quickly uh, and, and not spend a lot of time on. You can write them down and you can go back and look at it. But folks, our world is searching for truth. The people in our world are searching for truth and they're not finding it in the right places. And of course, when we come to one of that, it's because they, the truth is subjective. And when we come to that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that here as we go, because everybody has their own, there's chaos in our world. Well, truth is something which conforms with fact or reality. It's genuineness, it's veracity, it's actuality, it's reality, it's how things actually are. When you talk about truth theologically, truth is, is that which is consistent with the mind, the will, the character, the glory, and being of God. Because, folks, the Bible tells us that God is truth. Psalm 31 and Isaiah 65, the fathers called the God of truth. Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth, John says in his first chapter. 
In fact, he says that I am the truth, Jesus said in John 14. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. John 14 and 15 and 16. Paul calls scripture the word of truth. Jesus prayed, your word is truth. Everything about God is true. And God always tells it like it is. And how valuable is truth. Psalm 19 tells us that truth is more valuable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. And so what are the characteristics of truth? We'll do it again very quick. First is that truth is divine because all truth is God's truth. That which is true comes from God. That which is true comes from God. Even those who say it's so divine truth, even those who don't believe in God, the truth that they find is the truth that God gives them. That's our worldview, by the way, a biblical worldview, that all truth is God's truth. Truth comes from above, it's not from this world. Because who is the ruler of this world? The father of lies? Yeah, and he doesn't like the truth that is God's, and so he blinds and he lets everybody know about that. But I tell you, we need to understand that truth is not what the crowd speculates something to be. The truth is not determined by opinion polls. The truth is not discovered by public surveys. It's not grandfathered in by human tradition. Truth can really only be known by divine revelation that God reveals that truth. And God is the one source and the sole author of truth. Therefore, because of that, sin is what God says it is. Because of that, judgment is whatever God says it is. Salvation is what God says it is. Heaven and hell are what God says they are. It doesn't matter what man says about it. It matters what God has revealed about it. And he has revealed to us in his word the truth. Second, truth is absolute. See, without God there can be no absolutes. It's kind of funny. How are there any absolutes in the world if we don't have a standard of something? Where do we get that standard? Well, for those who don't believe in God, I guess it comes from man, and I guess it's culture that decides what those standards are, or society. And, and society can change, but there are absolutes, universal truths. See, without absolutes, truth becomes subjective, it becomes relative, it becomes pragmatic. Without absolutes, truth gives way to mere personal or cultural preferences. But all truth is absolute because God is absolute truth. So what is of truth is true. See, again, in our day, we don't have absolutes. We're in a, they've even defined the word. It's called, did you know we live in a post-truth world? Have you ever heard that term? It's a post-truth world. Meaning there are no absolutes. It's whatever you want it to be. And truth is truth. It's truth for you. See, if it's true for you, but it's not true for me, we all got truths. And so it makes everybody feel good, except that your truth isn't my truth, and I don't like your truth, so therefore your truth must be false, and I hate you because you have that truth and you don't like my truth. You see why we move into chaos? You see why everything goes awry? Now, I want to just say, keep going. Third truth is singular. And that is to say, truth is a single entity. You have the truth. And for God that brings it to us, it is the whole truth. And it's not we have a truth over here and a truth over there. And this country has this truth, and this country has this truth, and this people have this truth. And if we all bring it together, we'll figure out the truth. That's not how it works. See, truth is found in the one true God. Because it is single, it is internally consistent. And truth presents a singular worldview. And that's really where we want to go from. The truth that is presented in a biblical worldview, the truth that is presented by the Bible, the truth that has been revealed to us by God, presents one origin for the universe, one problem for the human race, 
One way of salvation, one way of holiness, one standard for the family, one plan for human history, one consummation of the age. It is singular. It's not all kinds of different things. Truth is consistent because it's singular. Truth is also objective. That means it's not subjective. In a real way, truth is black and white. And I know we don't like that. Oh, how we don't like that. God's truth is truth. Yeah, but can't we fudge a little bit on that, you know? Because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to hurt my feelings because if I really believe that, then I've got to live this way. And I don't want to. None of you ever do that to God, do you? I don't want to. Have you ever done that? Well, thank you for not admitting to it. I'll admit to it. I do that. Sometimes, God, I don't want to, but that's the truth. I still don't want to. That's the truth. Because it is objective, it speaks to all people in all places in the same way. Truth never speaks out of both sides of its mouth. It never caters to the crowd. It never says one thing to one person and something else to another. It's objective. In some ways, in that way, it's verifiable. Fifth, truth is immutable. That's just a big word that means it does not change. God does not change and neither does his truth, which cannot be true today but not true tomorrow. Folks, if we had a God that said this is what's true back here but it's not true now, you see what could happen with that? Why would we believe God about this if he says it can change? And lastly, truth is authoritative. Truth is authoritative. It speaks with the supreme authority of God. Truth is binding upon our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Truth demands our response. And I know that was the boring part of everything. But I want you to understand a little bit about what truth is. Because we find in ourselves, in this world, where if we don't know what truth is, we could find ourselves lost. Not lost salvation-wise. We would find ourselves lost. If we don't know what truth is, how can we tell anybody what it is? Or how can we live it out in our lives if we don't know what it is? And so Pilate asked the question and didn't wait around for the answer. We need to struggle with it a little bit. And then when we come to that conviction that is ours, that is really a conviction of faith in what God has said to us, then we understand that the truth that he gives us is something that we can hold on to. It's the truth of his character. God is truth. It is the truth of his promises that he keeps God is truth. And we can hold on to that in faith, knowing that whatever happens and whatever the circumstances, we can hold on to God's promises because God's promises are true. Because He is true. Truth is life changing. It renews our minds, it revives our hearts, it redirects our steps. Well, let's get back to Pilate. He didn't wait right around for the answer. We're told in another gospel that he heard that Jesus was from Galilee. And so he sends him to Herod. Jesus doesn't say anything to Herod because Herod is not interested in Jesus at all. And so Jesus comes back to Pilate. Three religious trials, three civil trials. And eventually he comes back Pilate says, hey, I'll release a prisoner to you. He's trying to get out of it. He doesn't want to deal with it. I'll release a prisoner to you. How about I release the king of the Jews? And the Jews say, ah, 
We'll take Barabbas. He's a revolutionary. He is about sedition. He is against the Roman Empire. But we'll take him because we want this man, Jesus, to die. Again, there are people who are confronted by Jesus. They're confronted by truth. And they evade the question. They evade the person of Jesus. They don't want to think about it. They want to just dismiss it. Pilate did the same thing. And in his encounter with him, we find again from Matthew's Gospel another question. The question that comes just before, if you will, chapter 19 of John. He says, what shall I then do with this Jesus? The Jewish leaders and the crowd respond, crucify him. And when we come to our world today, and we come to Easter, and we come to what we're looking at, and even in our own lives, the question remains often, even for us, what shall I do with this man, Jesus? And for those who've heard about who Jesus is, that is a question that you can end with if you're doing your personal evangelism. What are you going to do about him? What do you think about him? Because ultimately you can't just dismiss him and think that that'll be okay. Or that you'll come back. Maybe I'll come back and circle back to him later. But even those who know him, we ask ourselves that question sometimes. What are you going to do with this man, Jesus? Is he really going to be the king of your heart? Have you submitted and surrendered to him? So that you walk every day in submission to him? I won't ask if you do that. <laughs> I'll admit it. I don't always walk in submission to Jesus. Because there are times when I want to do what Daryl wants to do. Remember, Jesus, I don't want to. So what does that mean? I want to do what I want to do. Generally, it leads me to some problems. It may not be external, but it generally leads me to even some internal problems. And for that, I can go to Jesus. Remember that day as Christ stood before Pilate, he was really the authority. When Pilate came to Christ to, to examine him intellectually, Christ was examining him morally and spiritually. He was looking at Pilate. But he also understood that Pilate's place in God's sovereign plan was to have him crucified. And I think that Pilate thought that that would please the Jews the Jews thought that that would take care of the problem and make it keep on going. And so if you read chapter 19 and following, that's exactly what they did. And folks, we'll be looking at that on Friday as a church congregation. I pray that uh, you will uh, be here Friday for our Good Friday uh, service. Um, it's at 6.30. It'll be here. We'll also be having uh, our Lord's Supper as part of that, as we look at that. Human history has been divided between what became, came before Christ and what came after his life, death, burial, and resurrection. I want you to ask yourself this question. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? What are you doing with him in your life even now? What are you doing? Pray with me. 
Father, as we come before you, I pray that we will turn our eyes upon you and contemplate really the wonder of your redeeming love. You set your face to work for our redemption. And I pray, Father, that we will be good witnesses and ambassadors for you to share that redemption, that plan of reconciliation and peace with those around us. And I pray that we bring to you our offerings, that offering of ourselves, the offering of our time, the offering of our talent, Whatever you have given to us, we surrender and give to you that you might use it for your kingdom. Father, what do we do with you each and every day? May we set our hearts to loving you and loving what you've done for us and serving others as you've called us to do. First, it is to love God with all our hearts, soul, and mind body. And then we are to love others as ourselves. That's what you've called us to do. I pray that we answer that call. You call us softly. You call us tenderly. But you call. However it is today, help us to respond to your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. 479. <laughs>
got three dogs and a cat, you know? They, they, it's amazing the mess they make. It's amazing what I've got to see. I'm sure it's all there. It's all there. It's not mine. I'm a clean person. No, no. But yeah, uh, do remember Brother David, uh, I've not heard anything as of yet uh, in that regard. So, uh, more than anything, what they need right now is your prayers uh, rather than your phone calls, you know, that kind of thing. Um, as we get to know something that needs to be shared, we'll probably send it to Cindy so Cindy can send it out on text. If you want to get those texts, please, and you get that on your phone, let Cindy know. Uh, Jane still does the uh, by phone only kind of things, but we need phone numbers so we can make both of those happen. So. Uh, and we need to, we need to, that's how we pray. That's a good way for us to communicate with one another uh, and all that, all right? All right. I pray again that God will bless you. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, as we come to you this morning, we again thank you for our time together. Thank you for the way you bless us. Thank you for your word that teaches us, for the truth that the Holy Spirit shows us. May we live that truth, may we speak that truth, and may we be bold in doing so. Now bless this congregation. Walk with them wherever they might be this week. Wherever they find themselves, Father, walk and be with them. There they might find your peace in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.